there's something out there. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another lovely episode of excerpts from David Lubar's Curse of the Campfire Weenies. I actually got a request to make this video. A lovely gentleman by the name of Eli was listening to the first one and uh, mentioned this story in particular. So I think this is a great starting point for us. I'll, uh, I'll go as long as I can because, God damn it, I love doing these videos. So I, I am glad you enjoy listening to them so without any further ado get ready to hear me oof, just butcher the pronunciations on this one mergopana mergopana let's go with that mergopana <clears throat> the old man held a large rock in his left hand and spoke a single word he reached down with his right and grabbed a fistful of sand from the beach Brendan, sitting on a fallen tree several yards away, watched as his father tried to find meaning in the strange sounds. Shanbrook, the man said, lifting the rock higher. Shanbrook, Brendan's father said, writing the word on his notebook. The old man grinned. Brendan noticed that he had lost most of his teeth. Holding out his palm with a small mound of sand, the old man said, Shanbana. Shanbana. Brendan got up, walked barefoot across the warm sand, and stepped into the gentle surf that rippled against the north edge of this small island in the Pacific. I'm going out for a swim, he called to his father. Brendan's father gave him an absent-minded wave. Have fun! I will! Brendan waded away from the shore until he was waist-deep in the water, then leaned back and floated. This is the life, he thought. Even if his dad's work was kind of silly, Brendan was enjoying his time on Senshuju Island. How's that, fuckers? <laughs> he just wished things would get a little more exciting once in a while. Even paradise could get boring. Brendan drifted around looking over the... Sorry? Brendan drifted around and looked over toward the shore. His father was still talking to the old man, collecting more words. The people on this island, they called themselves the Washonu. Sure. <laughs> It spoke a language that wasn't used anywhere else. It wasn't even that all... It wasn't even all that much like any other known language. Wow, riveting. As far as Brendan could tell you, people who cared about languages, people like his father, went wild over the chance to study a new one. It was a sort of like when an astronomer found a new star or a biologist discovered an unknown animal. I'll be staying with them for a month, Brendan's father had explained. I have, a, have to compile a lexicon. That's a list of words in the language. And then I can start studying the grammar. I've made arrangements for you to come with me as well, if you'd like. It sounded pretty boring to Brendan. Oh, It sounded pretty boring to Brendan. At least it had sounded boring at first, but then he'd remembered something he'd learned in school. He thought about those $24 worth of beads and trinkets and how, if he remembered correctly, Peter, someone or other, had brought Manhattan Island that way. What can I buy with this shiny junk? Brendan wondered. I'd love to go, Brendan told his dad. Then he headed into town, where he picked up a nice assortment of fake jewelry, sparkly beads, and other glittery products of a plastic civilization. The islanders had gone crazy over the stuff, especially the rhinestones. It would have been perfect if they had anything good to trade, but they didn't have lots of knives or spears or anything cool. They had baskets and clothing. Brendan didn't need baskets, and he definitely want their used clothing. So he was stuck on Sensoju Island for a month with nothing to do but swim and lie on the beach. Could be worse, he thought, as he drifted with the rolling waves. The water was warm, the sun was warmer, and his dad let him sleep as late as he wanted. An hour later, when Brendan waded back into the beach, he saw that his father was just finishing up the interview with the old man. Brendan, this is fascinating. Come have a look. His father said, waving his notebook, he reached off, down to switch off the tape recorder. Sure, Brendan said, though he wasn't the least bit interested. He joined his father and looked at the notebook. As his father talked about 
Phone me more of them. Phone them round of vowel words. Brendan nodded and grunted, but he really wasn't paying any attention. The whole thing was boring. When his father was finished, they walked back toward their tent. On the way, they stopped to stare at the stone statue that stood in a clearing on the path. The natives referred to it as Murgobrook. But to Brendan, it might as well have been called Bugfish. It was a huge statue. I can't get over Bugfish, I'm sorry. Towering at least 20 feet in the air that looked like a combination of cockroach, a fish, and a lobster. The thing that always caught Brendan's eye was the mouth, with a pair of jaws lined with sharp teeth made of carved white shells. A fin with spiny bristles ran along the creature's back. It had five pairs of jointed legs. The front pair ended with its claws. Its body terminated in a forked tail that was covered in spikes. I'd hate to run into one of those, Brendan's father said. Not that such a thing could exist. Anything that size would be crushed under its own weight. That's a relief, Brendan said. He didn't think a creature like the Murgo Brook could exist, but the huge statue still gave him the creeps. A little one would be fun, he thought. Maybe he could get one of the natives to carve a small model for him to take home. Not that there was any way he could communicate his request. Real or not, his father said, it's certainly fascinating to observe the beliefs of an ancient culture from such a close vantage point. Imagine how we'll be able to learn once we know the basic language. He said more, but Brendan had turned him out again. They reached their tent, which was set up to the north of the Wanashu Wanashu village. Brendan saw some of the kids his age playing a game of small stones. He wandered over and waited for a minute, remembering the old the word the old man on the beach had used. Brendan pointed at the stone and said, Shanbrook? The boy looked at him and laughed. Then he said, Naibu. That was one of the few words Brendan knew. It meant no. He tried again. Shanpana? Nebu, Nebu, the boy said. He held up his stone. Shantoji. The word may have been foreign, but the way he said it carried the universal tone of someone patiently trying to educate an idiot. Forget it, Brendan said. He went back to the tent and got out his music player. He was going through batteries faster than he'd expected, but he really needed to sit back and blast some tunes. <laughs> Yo, dude, awesome, bro! His father came in a while later. While he started to talk, Brendan removed his headphones. Big day tomorrow, his father said. Some sort of special ceremony. Like what? Brendan asked. That sounded like it might be a nice change of pace. I don't know, his father said, but we'll find out soon enough. I think it has to do with this Murgo Brook. Great, Brandon thought. Some kind of bugfish ceremony. He put his headphones back on and listened to the music until he felt sleepy. On his Walkman? Why has he got batteries? Anyway. The next morning, Brandon was startled awake by shouting. A boy named Jesse. A boy named Jesse now. J-A-S-I, Jesse. Stuck his head into the tent and yelled, Murgo Bana, Tanu Ganwaroba. Misa, Misa, Solo. Brendan shot off the cot, wondering what was going on. He staggered outside, along with his father. The villagers were all heading toward the mountain that rose from the center of the island. Mountain, huh? Sure. What's going on? Brendan asked his father. I don't know, but it will be a great opportunity to learn about these people. Brendan and his father followed the villagers, who were hustling along the path. The people didn't seem panicked, but they were definitely tense. From all around, Brendan kept hearing one word. Murgopana. Once the people reached the inland cliffs, they streamed into a cave. After everyone was inside, they started to drag a large rock across the opening using wooden handles. Wo- wooden handles tied to it with ropes. Ugh. The village chief looked out toward Brendan and his father. He pointed into the cave and said something. Should we join them? Brendan asked. We won't learn anything in there, his father said. I'm pretty sure that whatever they're hiding from is going to happen out here. He turned toward the chief and said, Nebu. The chief touched his chest in a gesture that Brendan knew meant farewell. Brendan watched as the boulders sealed the villagers within the cave. You sure we're safe? Positive, his father said. They kept mentioning Weroba. That's the ocean. Whatever's supposed to happen, I think it will happen there. He headed toward the beach, and Brendan followed him. Again, they paused in front of the statue of Murgo Brook. Why were they shouting Murgo Pana? Brendan asked. I'm not sure, his father asked. Brook means big, and Toji means small. They attached that 
to the end of the word. For example, Horu is man, so they call me Horubrook. And they call you Horo Toji. I'm the big man, and you're the little man. What about Pana? Brendan asked as he reached the beach. His father shook his head. I haven't quite figured that one out yet. It could mean tiny. Well, if the Murgo Pana shows up, we'll know the answers, Brendan said. He plunked down on the fallen tree and dug into the sand with his toes. He looked out towards the water. It was unusually calm today. Maybe the natives were afraid of calm water, he thought. <laughs> that made him grin. He glanced down at the sand. Shanapana. The world bubbled up into his mind. Shanapana? Brendan thought back to the day before. The ocean grew less calm. The water started to churn. Brendan turned towards his father. Shanbrook means big rock, right? Very good, his father said. And I thought you really weren't interested in my work. Brennan looked ahead. The water almost seemed to be boiling now. It was frothing and splashing like a hard rain was pounding it. But the sky was clear. Brendan rose from the fallen tree and took a step towards the ocean. Shanpana, he thought. That's what the old guy called his handful of sand. A handful of sand. Many little rocks. Many little... Brendan looked at the sand at his feet. Then he looked at the water just ahead of him. The surf practically exploded into a burst of activity. Mergopana, Brendan said, suddenly understanding. Mergobruck was the huge statue. It wasn't real. It was far too big to exist. But Mergopana, that was different. Brendan screamed as the Mergopana burst from the surf and swarmed onto the beach. They looked like the large statue, but each one was only the size of a scorpion. There seemed to be hundreds of them, maybe thousands. They charged onto the sand, wave after wave. The air filled with the clicking of their claws as they headed toward Brendan's father. Pana! Brendan's father shouted. I know what it means now! I'm way ahead of you, Dad, Brendan said. He turned to run. But the many small creatures, the Murgo Pana, had another quality Brendan was about to discover. They were small, but they were also very fast. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Uh, uh not bad. I, obviously, the I'm a, I'm a, I'm a wee bit biased because of all the weird ass words I I had to learn, like mogopana. But uh, interesting. I don't really like it or dislike it. I I'm just interested. And let's keep that that interesting train rolling. This one I vaguely remember, unlike mogopana. So, let's see what we have in store for us with a little tale called Eat Your Veggies. I'm going <clears> to <throat> go in my throat and have a little sip of water here. All right. <clears throat> Eat your spinach, Ed's mother said. She pointed to the mushy green puddle of overcooked goop that quivered on the otherwise empty plate. No way, Ed shook his head. Why should I? Bad things happen if you don't eat your vegetables, his mother said. <laughs> yeah, right. Ed took a deep breath. He was not going to eat that spinach no matter what. Ed pushed back his chair and stood. He took his plate and walked over to the garbage can. Then, watching his mother out of the corner of the eye, he scraped the green glop into the garbage and waited for the explosion. She didn't say a word. Ed wanted to say, See, nothing bad happened. But he knew that he'd be pushing his luck if he spoke. So he just gathered up the garbage bag and took it to the curb, removing even the slightest possibility that he'd have anything more to do with the spinach. The tall bag fell on its side, but Ed didn't care. As he walked back toward the house, a mouse came running from underneath the porch. Its keen sense of smell picked up the marvelous aroma of cooked vegetables. The mouse started gnawing at the bag. In seconds, the wonderful spinach gushed onto the ground. Soon, several other mice came, drawn by the aroma and the sound of a feast. Ed walked into the kitchen, still half amazed that he'd gotten away with it. He looked over at his mom. She was washing dishes and paying no attention to him. Down the street, a cat lifted her head, her ears twitching at all the sounds and scent of prey. She rose slowly, stretched, and padded along the sidewalk toward the mice. There's no need to slink and stalk. Prey was busy feasting and would never know she was there until it was too late. 
I'd put an empty bag in the garbage can. <laughs> As opposed to putting a full bag in the garbage can. Normally, he would have waited until he was home to do this, but now he saw the can as his partner in the war against vegetables. Future dinners would be so much more pleasant. I'd considered the joys of dumping Brussels sprouts or tossing out lima beans. Across the street from Ed's house, a dog spotted the cat and pulled at the rope that held in front of his yard. As the dog yanked, the poorly tied rope slipped free. The dog leaped over the fence and started across the road, barking and growling. Ed went through the kitchen to the living room, ready for the best part of the evening. He sat on the couch and picked up the remote control. Down the street, a car carrying a man who was coming home from work swerved to avoid hitting a dog. The car hit a utility pole instead. The airbag worked, saving the driver from harm, but the pole broke. It fell, snapping all the wires, including the one that brought cable television to Ed's home. Ed turned on the television. There was nothing but static. He tried another channel. It was dead. They were all dead. He shouted, The television isn't working! Well, his mother cried from the kitchen, Maybe next time you'll eat your vegetables. Okay. All right, campfire weenies. That's cheeky. I, w I was expecting it like, you know, the fucking power line falls on his house and kills the kid. With David Lubar, man, especially after the Alexander watches a play, I thought that would be a lot more crazy crazy surrealness well huh i still kind of like it it's 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 dumb and cheeky but you know i i, I must admit i have a slight soft spot <clears throat> inquire within is the name of our next tale this has to be some kind of joke quinn said holding up the current issue of the sound of the scene the local free weekly paper that covered music and entertainment let me see, Delia leaned over to read the ad. Turn in witches, make money, help protect society. It's gotta be a joke or something, Delilah said. It's probably a publicity for a play or some movie. I don't know, Quinn pointed to the bottom of the ad. The address is real. Let's go check it out. Delia sighed, then got up from the couch. Whatever. Quinn wasn't her brightest friend, and, and this would turn out to be something totally stupid. But there was nothing on the television, and she was bored. You can say TV, dude. You, you don't gotta say television all at once. The, <clears throat> the place was way downtown in a little street filled with junk shops and places selling stuff only tourists would want. There was no name on the window. Just a small sign that read, Inquire Within. Delia tried to look inside, but the place was far too dark for her to see anything. It's closed, she said. Quinn turned the knob. It's open. She went inside. Delia followed her. There was nothing inside except for a table with four chairs. A young woman sat at one of the chairs, drinking tea. We want to find out about turning in witches, Quinn said. Delia expected the woman to laugh at her or toss them out, but instead, she smiled, pointed to a chair, and said, Have a seat. What's the deal? Delia asked as she sat. Witches are a threat to us, the woman said. Tea? No thanks, Quinn said. The woman's voice sounded normal to Delia, but her words were crazy. There are no witches, Delia said. The woman shrugged. Then you can't make any money here. Quinn glared at Delilah. Delia? Oh, has it been Delia this whole time? My god, it's, it's Delia, isn't it? Or is it Delilah? No, I think it's missing an L for Delilah. Anyway, let's say there are witches. What kind of reward do you want to pay? Hmm? Five hundred dollars. When Delia heard that, it no longer mattered to her whether the woman was crazy. If she was willing to hand out that kind of money, Delia was willing to play her crazy game. Do we have to bring the witch here? Delia asked. She had already asked a couple people. She already had a couple people in mind. Creepy, spooky people who deserve to get in trouble. No, the woman said, just bring the information. Delia stood. Great. Once they got outside, Quinn asked, so how do we find a witch to turn in? One second, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Real quick pause. All right. We just look for the right signs, Delia said. You know, spooky lady who lives alone. Maybe bad things happen to her enemies, or maybe she never ages. Miss Miller, Quinn shouted. 
naming their art teacher. Right, Delia said. She's got that wart on her chin. And remember what happened with Tony Bedner after he made fun of her in class? Oh, yeah, that was awful. Delia had forgotten about that. Tony had fractured his leg the next day, slipping on a perfectly smooth and dry piece of sidewalk. He also knocked out three teeth. Even if Miss Miller wasn't really a witch, there might be enough evidence to earn Quinn and Delilah the reward. Let's go back to my place and make up a list, she said. By the end of the evening, the girls had come up with nine people who might be witches. They had strong evidence for at least three of them. Oh, sure, in the kangaroo court. Who would have thought that there were so many witches, Quinn said. Delia nodded. She still didn't really believe in witches, but she had to admit there was a lot of proof that there was something strange about these people. And if Delia and Quinn got paid for even one of the nine, that would be a lot of money. What's going to happen to them? Quinn asked. You think they'll get in trouble? That's not our problem. Delia put the pad away. Then she yawned. Wow, it's kind of late. I'm getting pretty sleepy. Do you mind if we uh, don't watch a movie? That's fine. Quinn got up and headed for the door. See you tomorrow. Yeah, see you tomorrow. As the door closed, Delia grabbed the list. It was late, but maybe the place was still open. I came up with all this, she thought. Or at least most of this, so I split the money with Quinn. Besides, Quinn kept acting like she didn't want to go through with it. But how to keep Quinn from finding out? Delia smiled, grabbed her pen, and added Quinn's name to the list. She'd get the money, and then, in the morning, tell Quinn she changed her mind. Then if Quinn went by herself, the woman would call her a witch, and Quinn would think she was crazy and go away. Perfect. Delia headed out. The door was unlocked. The woman was there. I found some witches, Delia said. The woman seemed excited. She pointed to a seat. Delia sat, then slid the list over to her. The woman spent a minute reading the list. Then she reached under the table and grabbed a metal box. She put it down and flipped open the lid. Delia gasped as she saw it. Delia gasped as she caught sight of stacks of cash. I just need to ask a couple of questions about each entry. We have to be sure before we take action. This is a very serious business. No problem, Delia said. Tell me about the first one, the woman said. She poured a cup of tea for Delia. She's an art teacher, Delia said. She described the evidence, then took a sip of tea. And the next one, the woman asked. Delia told the woman about her neighbor, Miss Savaro. She talked for a long time, trying to hold off the moment when she had to make up lies about Quinn. As Delia finished describing the third person on her list and drained the last of her cup, she asked the one thing that had been bothering her. Why are you so eager to find witches? We're not, the woman said. We? Delia asked. She noticed that there were people standing near the walls on both sides of her watching them. But they were hidden in the shadows. The darkness seemed to grow from the walls. The shadows seemed to pulse like they were breathing, and with each breath they drew closer to her. We, the woman said, were not trying to find witches. The, why? Delia blinked. She was so tired. A nap would be nice. We're looking for people who would accuse someone of being a witch, the woman said. She laughed. But it sounded to Delia like a cackle. She tried to stand, but her legs had turned to thick, limp ropes. Hot. She tried to scream for help, but her tongue had become a useless scrap of cloth. We like it here, the woman said, and we plan to stay. Which means we need to get rid of dangerous, meddlesome people like you. Delia was far too sleepy to listen anymore. She rested her head on the table, closed her eyes, and drifted off. When Quinn, when Quinn reached Delia's house the next morning, she was surprised to find the police there. Delia was missing. The police asked Quinn what she and Delia had done yesterday. Watch movies, talk, that kind of stuff. Quinn couldn't admit they thought about doing something as stupid and mean as a witch hunt. It had seemed fun for a moment or two, but last night, as she thought about it, she realized she wasn't that kind of girl to do that to someone. Not that it mattered. Delia was right. There was no such thing as witches. Rock and roll! Damn, that, that's, that's, that's a good one. 
simple, sweet, elegant. Still got that classic, like, I love the vagueness of it. She just gets drugged and passes out and is never seen again. Perfect. Excellent. That's a good horror, baby. But we're not done. I, I will take one more sip and we will continue on this carnival of horror. I always love those, though. You know, there's a great podcast called The Vault of Horror. If you're interested in this sort of, like, reading of horror. And the, and the guy who it is the Crypt Keeper has got this great voice. It's way down here and very gravelly. You know? I wish I could do that. You know, I wish I had that, like, Crypt keeper voice. But I don't, so hopefully this is a decent substitute. This one I remember. I'm, rem- I'm remembering it right now <laughs> as I'm about to read it. So let's let's get into it before I get too far ahead of myself. <clears throat> Three. I'm warning you, Dennis, come inside. Oh, that's his mom. Oops. Um. Hey, it's me, your mom. I'm warning you, Dennis, come inside right now, his mother said as she stood by the open front door of their house. Just a second, Dennis said without looking up. He was almost finished with the fort he was building for his toy soldiers. He just had to put a few more stones on one side and it would be perfect. No, his mom said. Coming! Dennis started to stand up. <laughs> Coming! Oh, fuck. He started to stand up, but he kept placing stones. I'm getting crazy. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Coming! Dennis started to stand up, but he kept placing stones, adding to the last of them from a crouching position. One! His mother said. Dennis quickly added the final stone. Two! All right, all right, I'm coming! Dennis stood and ran up to the porch. That had been close. His mother had almost reached three. Dennis looked up at his mother. At his mother. Dennis looked up at his mother and wondered what would happen if he let the finish count. The next day, he was still thinking about that when he was playing with his friends Lance and Trevor. What happens if your mom or dad reaches three? Dennis asked. I don't know, Lance said. Your mom n- your mom ever get to three? Dennis asked Trevor. Nope, Trevor said. I always tell myself I'm going to ignore her, but then I chicken out when she reaches two. Yeah, me too, Lance said. I'm going to do it, Dennis said. I'm going to find out. <laughs> no, Lance said. It's too dangerous. There's no telling what might happen. I don't care. I'm going to find out. I got a real big wiener. At the moment... Dennis heard the call from down the street. Dennis, lunchtime, come home. Give me a minute, Mom. He called back. Then he sat on the ground and grinned at his friends. Dennis, I want you to come right now, his mother called. Coming, Dennis said, still sitting and still grinning. One. Dennis sat. Two. Dennis couldn't do it. He leaped to his feet and ran into the house. It was almost as if some force took control of his body. He couldn't fight the power of hearing his mom count. His mom's count approach three. He tried again the next day, and yet again the day after that. Each time, no matter how much he told himself he'd fight the call, Dennis was unable to resist the force that made him obey. You guys are just gonna have to hold me back, he told his friends the next day. What? Lance asked. Hold me. When my mom starts counting, I want you to hold me until she reaches three. Give me a little kiss. I don't know, Trevor said. We can all get in trouble. Come on, Dennis said. We gotta fight now. What's the worst thing that could happen? He kept arguing until his friends finally agreed to help. At dinner time, when the call came, Dennis sat on the ground. Each of his friends knelt by his side and grabbed an arm. One, his mom called. Dennis sat not yet feeling any urge to rise. Two, his mom called. A two! Suddenly, Dennis panicked. Let me up, he shouted at his friends, struggling to break free. He couldn't get loose. Three! The words swept down the street with the force of an ocean wave. Lance and Trevor suddenly let go of Dennis and stepped back. They both stared at him, wondering what was going to happen. Behind him, Dennis heard a door slam across the street heard another door slam suddenly all up and down the block doors slammed people were leaving their houses moms and dads were walking out as dennis watched dozens of parents walked from their houses and out into the street and they walked away 
Without a word, they left. Dennis saw his mom and dad. He ran after them, but they just kept walking. Finally, Dennis stopped chasing them. He just stood and watched them walk off. Lance's mom was leaving, too. Trevor's mom and dad were also going. Lance and Trevor turned back toward Dennis. It's all your fault, Lance said. You ruined everything. Yeah, Trevor said. Let's get him. Dennis took a step back. He opened his mouth to call for help. Then he shut it. There was no one to call, he realized. There was no help. Hell yeah, baby! That's that's how you that's how that's how you gotta teach these kids, boy. You gotta scare the piss out of them. I tell you what, man. We gotta do one more, right? We gotta do at least one more. One more. Fat face. It's funny. Remember earlier when I was like, "Oh, I fucking remember this one." I was wrong. So. Mm-mm, clear my nose. Have a sip, and let's read fat face. Shall we? <clears throat> In autobiography. I like food. I can't help it. The rest of my life is pretty miserable, but when I'm eating, I'm happy. I try to be as happy I try to be happy as much as possible. The kids in school call me fat face. They call me worse things too. And they tease me. They run up behind me when I'm walking home and poke me real hard. They know I can't catch them. It's a good thing for them I can't run fast. If I caught one of them, I'd pound him until he said he was sorry. I tried to lose weight. Heck, I tried a hundred different times. I just can't stay on a diet. The worst problem is the older kids. They're too big for me to hit. And they love to torture me. Especially Ronald Volger. He's two years older. He's been kicked out of school five times. He thinks he's so cool because all the girls say he's good looking. He acts like some kind of movie star. I was walking home from school when Ronald snuck up on me from behind. At least it wasn't the fucking Hamburglar. I was just about to unwrap my Choco Squirt Bar. It's my favorite. Nice gooey chocolate. Nice gooey chocolate with caramel cream. Unst! And little hard pieces of that buttery candy. Man, it's good. And after you eat it, the hard pieces stick to the back of your teeth. So there's something to enjoy for a long time. woo It's a real mess to eat, though. Not that I mind. I was so busy thinking about how awesome that bar would taste that I didn't notice Ronald. I didn't even know he was there until he snatched the Choco Squirt from my hand. Got it! He grinned at me with a face full of perfect teeth and waved my Choco Squirt in the air. Fuck, he's hot. I got a candy bar. I got a candy bar. A big bug, I said, and took a step forward. I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> oh, I took another step, but I didn't get too close. And if he turned and ran, I'd never catch him. Why are bullies always so fast and strong? Come on, it's mine. Give it back. Oh, his fat face gonna cry. This fat face want his gooey, chewy candy. Stop it. He reached up and started to tear the wrapper. He kept grinning, giving me the same smile he uses in school to get himself out of trouble with the teachers. Don't! I said, please don't! I said, I clenched my fist. It looks so good, I can't wait. He opened his big mouth and bit down on the Choco Squirt Bar, chomping it right through the wrapper. Rage flooded me, washing away all common sense and caution. Screaming, I charged at him. He laughed and jogged away. Mmm, yum, that tastes good. Thanks for sharing, fat face. I heard him take another chomp. He looked over his shoulder at me as he ran, his face already smeared with chocolate, a ribbon of caramel dripping from the corner of his lip. I gasped, unable to say more than that while I chased after him. Blood pounded in my skull. My lungs burned. The muscles in my legs felt as if they'd stabbed... As if I'd been stabbed with jagged pieces of glass. Ronald turned off the sidewalk. Ronald! I can't get over that! Fucking Ronald! What a weird choice of bully name. Anyway, sorry. Ronald turned off the sidewalk and jogged through the lot by the old McClellan house. By the old McClellan estates. Nobody lived there, now. 
Even while the McClellans lived there, the place had been a garbage pit, and old refrigerators, broken furniture, and tons of other junk littered the yard. I weaved my way through the pile of appliances, trying to grab hold of Ronald. I may as well have been trying to grab a shadow. He just kept getting out of my reach. I knew he was playing, toying with me, getting as much fun as he could from my anger. The smartest thing I could have done would have been to stop chasing him, but I was too angry to be smart. As he went around the side of the house, he spun toward me and started running backward. That hurt more than the rest of it. Even when he ran backward, I couldn't catch him. Despite the rage that drove me, I was ready to give up. I was nearly dead from running. My heart was trying to explode. My knees had turned from a solid to a thick liquid. Nice. Hashtag thick liquid. I slowed from a run to walk. I slowed from a run to walk. I tried to get air in my lungs. Feel too small for the job. Ooh, let's just do a slam poetry now. Ronald slowed too, but he kept going backward. Bad move. He backed into a couple of old oil drums. He stumbled over one of them and fell, knocking down more stuff. Scrap piles smashed around him with a sound like a thousand gong bells. When the avalanche stomped, Ronald was lying face down, pinned flat on the ground. I felt the drum that was across his leg. It was probably heavier than I could move. He let out a stream of swear words. He, he said naughty words. And then he said, Help me. He tried to look at me, but there was a hunk of steel beam across the back of his neck, so he couldn't even turn his head. I noticed the remains of the Choco squirt in his fist. I saw the smears of chocolate and caramel on his face. I noticed something else. I get it. I'm sorry. Let me do it properly. <clears throat> I'll get help, I said. Hurry, he said. I will. I couldn't stop staring at the ground. Get moving, you fat blimp. Sure, I'll go as fast as I can, I told him. I walked a few steps away, then paused. I was still out of breath. Took a few more steps. I guess I could have gone faster, but I was tired. And I kept stopping to think about what I'd seen. Behind me, I heard the first startled shout from Roland. Roland? Ronald. It wasn't very loud. The next cry was a bit louder. I moved farther away, not wanting to be near when the real screaming started. I stopped again to catch my breath and close my eyes. In my mind, I could see his face, covered with chocolate and caramel, pushed flat against the ground. His face was right next to dozens of little pieces of dirt. The sort of piles any kid recognizes instantly. Ant hills. Red ants. The kind with a bite that feels like fire. As the screams grew louder, I walked around the house and headed toward the street. I did say I'd get help for him, and I would. I just wasn't in any hurry. My face might be fat, but at least I had a face. As I walked, I reached into my pocket for another Choco Squirt, but when I saw Roland's face again in my mind, I saw it as it was becoming. My hand dropped to my side. I realized I wasn't at all interested in needing anything right now. Maybe this time, if I held on to that image, I'd finally be able to stick to a diet. <laughs> it's me, Tom Savini, on the back of a van, throwing creep show comics at you. <laughs> oh, I do. Do we do one more? I'm I'm having such a gay old time. I hope you don't mind me dicking around with the the source material. I'll, I'll never be able to read it perfectly straight, you know, like Simon and Schuster Audio presents. So, like, I have to make it fun. So, I, I hope you, you are enjoying the fun. One more. One more. This is the last one. This is it. One more. For all the, all the, all the, all the beans, baby, this is the soda fountain. Ben always paused for just a moment before he went into Mr. Paulson's shop. That was one of the ways he, that made the whole experience last longer. It felt like that Saturday afternoon really started when he put his hand against the frosted glass of the door and it ended when he stepped back outside. The span of time in between, well, that was certainly the best part of the day and absolutely the best part of the week. Ben knew there weren't a lot of soda shops left. There were other places where a kid could get a soda, could get a soda made from syrup and seltzer, but there wasn't but there weren't many spots where a kid could really sit, enjoy his soda. He showed up and take his time. But as long as it was Paulson's sweet shop, Ben was happy. Ben pushed the door open. The soda fountain was at the back of a small shop. Ben walked between the two rows of magazine racks, looking for anything new that might have come in. 
Nothing caught his eye. The lingering aroma of bacon drifted through the air. Mr. Paulson didn't just make sodas. He also cooked breakfast on the weekends. But Ben wasn't interested in bacon and eggs. Hey, here comes my favorite customer, Mr. Paulson said. He was standing behind the counter with a rag in his hand. He always had a cloth ready for wiping up spills. Hi, Ben said, climbing up onto the stool. He spun around, once to the left and once to the right. So, what can I make for you today? That was the question, wasn't it? <laughs> ben never knew ahead of time what he would order. There were so many choices. That was one of the wonders of syrups. They could be combined. You could get a cola or a cherry cola or a chocolate cola or a chocolate cherry cola or a zillion other flavors of cola. Cherry vanilla, Ben said, suddenly realizing what he wanted. Mr. Paulson nodded. Good choice. Coming right up. He took a paper cup and squirted it with streams of thick syrup from the pumps on the counter. Then he grabbed a hose and sprayed seltzer into the syrup. Cherry vanilla. He said, giving Ben a smile as he placed the cup in front of him. Thanks. A cluster of straws stood in a glass container on the counter. Ben selected one, peeled off the wrapper, resisting the urge to shoot the paper across the room, and put the straw in the soda. It was hell. That first cool, amazing sip was always the best. I'm going out to the bayou now, all down there. The rest was great. Sorry, the rest was great, but there was nothing like the first tingling taste. Sweet, cold, and buble. Ben spun around again on the stool. There was nobody else in the store. There never was. Sometimes Ben wondered how Mr. Paulson stayed in business, but the store was always there, waiting for him. Mr. Paulson wiped the counter with his rag. Ben took a long, slow sip. They were separated by years in age. But they were like two old friends, comfortable with their routine. Behind Mr. Paulson, the girl sputtered and flared up. He barely glanced over her shoulder, then shrugged. Guess I better guess I better get that old thing fixed one of these days. This this is my voice, right? Is this a bit too high? You let me know if it's not a hundred percent accurate as it was earlier. Guess you'd better, Ben said. Whoa! Guess you'd better, Ben said, smiling. He'd heard that before. Finally, no matter how slowly Ben sipped, he reached that last noisy slurp. Thanks, he stood. He said, putting his money on the counter. He pushed the cup forward and got off the stool, spinning around once more for the pleasure of it. For the pure fucking thrill. Come again, Mr. Paulson said. I sure will. Golly, Mr. <laughs> ben retraced his path to the door. As he stepped outside, the light hurt his eyes for a moment. When he could see clearly again, he noticed a little girl and mother walking up the street. The girl ran ahead of the mother. My name's Brandy, she said. What's your name? Ben Jensen. What were you doing in there, she asked. Getting a soda. I always get a soda on Saturdays, Ben said. You must be crazy, she backed away from him. Mr. Paulson died two years ago when the sweet shop burned down. Ben opened his mouth, but he couldn't think of a reply. There really wasn't anything worth saying to this silly little girl. The mother grabbed her daughter's hand. Who are you talking to, she asked. To Ben Jensen, the girl said. Young lady, her mother said. You know better than to say such things. Ben died two years ago with a sweet shop burned down. What would people think if they heard you talking like that? She led her daughter quickly down the street. Ben watched them go. He wondered why the woman would say such a ridiculous thing, but that didn't matter. What mattered was that it was time for a soda. He turned to the door of Paulson's sweet shop, pausing for a moment to make the experience last longer. Some things were just too wonderful to rush. <laughs> Ooh, I'm a ghostly fucking ten-year-old. How long is this one? Uh, let's do sniffles. I, I'm having such a good fucking time, y'all. I don't want to stop. So, all right. For real. The last one. I'm looking at my timer here. We're like approaching 45 minute the hour mark. Clear my throat. We'll do this last one. Bada bing, bada boom. That's the video. So, th for real, the last one. Just let me prepare myself. <coughs> All right. <coughs> 
Let me get my own sniffles out and then clark. <clears throat> sniffles. So I sniff a little once in a while. Everybody does. But mom is the kind of parent who slaps a band-aid on every scratch and considers a chest cold an occasion for extreme medical measures. In other words, for mom, my sniffling was a reason to go to the doctor. But not any doctor. Mom was taking me to see an allergist. I knew what that meant. My friend Gilbert had allergies. He got a shot every week. There was no way I was putting up with that. Even with the shots, Gilbert was a mess. He stayed away from any place that had cats, dogs, birds, or rodents. I'm actually allergic to cats and dogs, so I feel your pain, dude. He avoided all kinds of foods. Again, I yep. He wouldn't even come over to my house after he spotted a tiny bit of poison ivy growing on the side of one tree. This is completely unnecessary, I told my mom as she pulled into the parking lot. I didn't hear her answer. My attention was snagged by a totally awesome car. It looked like one of those sports cars they only made 10 of a year. Maybe a custom-built Lamborghini or Maserati or something. The license plate said, Sneeze DR. Sneeze Doctor. Very funny. Like a snot man will already take him. Went to the waiting room and took a seat. All too soon, a nurse popped her head in and said, Norman. The way she was smiling, I knew I was going to suffer some serious pain. In my pant, though, I followed her down a hall into the examination room. She took my blood pressure, and then patted my head down and said, What a good boy you are. And then she referred to herself as Mommy and asked if I wanted to be stepped on. I wondered whether I should bark or maybe tell her what a good nurse I was. Dr. Grandier won't be right with you, she said. Sure enough, Dr. Grandier came in a minute later carrying a clipboard. So, uh, he stopped and glanced at his clipboard. Norman, you got allergies. Not really, I said, catching myself in mid-sniffle. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Allergies are very common, but I can help. Where do you go to school? I told him. Do you play sports? Soccer, I said, and basketball. You have a lot of friends? I'm pretty popular. Relatives? A bunch. What's this have to do with allergies? I was dying for one good sniffle, but there was no way I was going to do that in front of him. I was still hoping to prove to him that I didn't have any allergies. I'm just getting a sense of how many people you come in contact with, he said. I looked over at the counter that ran along the two walls. It had dozens of small bottles on it. Are you going to test me? That's the worst thing Gilbert told me about. The doctor scratched his arm with all this different stuff to see what he was allergic to. He told me his arm puffed up like a marshmallow in the microwave. Dr. Grandier shook his head. No, I don't think that'll be necessary in your case. One shot should do the trick. He unlocked a cabinet and removed a small bottle. Just one? Normally I'd fight against even that, but after figuring I'd be jabbed a zillion times, getting tested for everything from pollen to cat dander, and then shot up with allergy stuff each week, I wasn't going to complain. The shot didn't even hurt. It should kick in by tomorrow, Dr. Grandier said. Nice car, I said as I got out of my chair. It's my one luxury, he said. I went back to the waiting room. Mom was happy that I'd be cured until she wrote out a check for me to pay for my visit. I was happy the whole thing was over. Sure enough, the next morning I wasn't sniffling at all. But Mom was. So was everyone on my bus. When I got to school, Gilbert ran up to me, started to say something, and sneezed so hard I thought he'd snap his neck. I ducked, but I wasn't fast enough to avoid all these Oh, man, he said after he wiped his nose with a handkerchief he always carried, because it's 18th century fucking Charles Dickens found. It must be a high pollen count or something. I've been doing so well. I got one shot and I'm fine, I said, wiping my face. No way. Who's your doctor? Dr. Grandier. My mom says he's real expensive. I shrugged. I wasn't paying for it. Besides, I only had to go one time, so the cost didn't matter that much. Gilbert sneezed again, but I managed to get out of the way this time. The kids who sat near me in class were sniffling and sneezing too. So were my teammates. Both my parents sneezed all through dinner. The next day I noticed Gilbert was wearing latex gloves. What's up with that? I asked him. I'm just trying to isolate myself from allergens, he said. Reached into his backpack and pulled out a box of disposable gloves. Here, help yourself. I got plenty. I was going to tell him how ridiculous that was, but he was too busy sneezing to listen to me. I did grab some gloves, but only because they make cool water balloons. 
Well, not stupid, but it still took me a couple days to figure out what was going on, or another day or two to convince myself I wasn't crazy. Dr. Grandier's allergy shot had worked in more ways than one. Thanks to him, people were allergic to me. And when I got near, I started sneezing. I went into town that day after school and waited until he came out of his office. Ah, Norton, right? He said, and he looked at his car keys. Norman. Whatever. What'd you do to me? I asked. He tried to look innocent. I just gave you an allergy shot. Right, and now everyone's allergic to me. He opened his mouth like he was going to deny it, but then he just shrugged and said, It'll wear off in a couple of weeks. You should take that as a compliment. What? That formulation is pretty hard to obtain. I wouldn't waste a shot on someone who isn't popular. You turned out to be an excellent choice. I've already picked up plenty of new appointments. He turned away from me and reached toward the door of a sports car. Wait, I... He looked over his shoulder at me. What? You don't see anything wrong in what you did? I was hoping for at least some sign that when he knew that he knew this wasn't right. Nothing at all. You finished complaining? Yeah, I'm finished. He grabbed the handle, opened the door, and slid into the seat, patted the steering wheel. When you're too young to understand how things work, I got bills to pay. It's still wrong. I stepped closer and let out a sneeze. It was obviously a fake one, and that was pretty childish. It wasn't even very wet, but it was moist enough to do the trick. He wiped his face with his hand and then closed the car door. I watched him drive off. Maybe he was right. I should feel glad that I'm popular. I'm glad the shot will wear off, but mostly, I was glad I wore gloves when I rubbed the poison ivy all over the door handle of his car. And I was glad I wasn't Dr. Grandier. <laughs> Okay, that's that's it, folks. Uh, thank you for joining me on on another wonderful episode of David Lubar is a spooky little fella. I love doing them, so hopefully y'all enjoy listening to him. Shout out to my boy Eli. Hope you enjoyed, my friend. See you next time. Bye. <laughs>